All right, thank you everyone. We'll just give it a few more minutes to let folks uh, get logged in and get started. About a minute or two. All right, I think we can get started now. So thank you all for joining today. So my name is Tim Chanch. I am a staff attorney with Maryland Volunteer Lawyer Service. Um, and today we are lucky to have Julian Malvin Griffin from uh, the Minnesota Lawyers Mutual Insurance Company talk to us today about some of the leading causes of malpractice claims and bar complaints for attorneys in Maryland. Uh, so today she's gonna be talking to us about current statistics and steps in attorney discipline cases. Uh, she'll talk about some common scenarios. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to pass it over to you, Joy. Thanks so much, Tim. I will begin by sharing my screen. We have a presentation for you today, just to, like Tim said, to talk about the top malpractice claims that we've seen in the insurance industry. Uh, Minnesota Lawyers Mutual it's proud to service Maryland and all of Maryland attorneys. Um, there is no area of practice that is too big or too small. That's why we're going to talk about as much as we can in the hour that we are together, because it can affect all areas of practice. But what do we really know about malpractice in and of itself? We know that we might need insurance. They talk to us about it when we're in law school, but not to this extent. So let's just do a quick overview on the different types of malpractice we see. So first of all, there's malpractice and there's professional discipline. And what I want you to get from this is that malpractice is when we're normally seeing a suit, a suit that's being filed against an attorney that's designed to compensate the victim for something the attorney did wrong. And when we look at a malpractice case, uh, because not only am I the regional director for Virginia, but I'm also a claims attorney. So whenever we have to use defense counsel to come in and to assist us with cases such as malpractice suits, we look for a negligence claim. OK, so we know about the duty, the breach, the causation um, and the damages. It's the same thing that you would see there. And in most all of malpractice suits, there has to be some substantiation made by an expert witness. So if this gets to the point that uh, there's discovery and, and experts have to be called in, there has to be someone to say that the attorney, in their professional opinion, did breach whatever duty that is alleged in the complaint, okay? This does not have any impact um, on the lawyer's license in as far as what a judge or jury can do. Now, in many malpractice cases, if a lawyer is found guilty, yes, there might be a subsequent uh, bar complaint or something that's uh, made to the AGC's office. Uh, however, 
in this particular instance, the case alone will not have um, a direct impact on the attorney's license. Whereas a professional discipline case, as I stated uh, before with the AGC's office, now that's different. That is when uh, they will get involved and they will do their preliminary investigation. They will ask, for those of you have, who have not been through the process, they will let you know that a complaint has been filed against you, you will have an opportunity to respond to that. If you have malpractice insurance, the moment that you receive that notice of a complaint, you must let your malpractice insurance carrier know, even if you think that you can answer it on your own. It is very, very important that you let them know. Yes, because they can get defense counsel to assist you with it. But number two, a lot of times when we see something like this, we think with emotion. OK, we're very quick to say what we thought we did right, what we thought we didn't do, and then we're handing over everything. Defense counsel will come in to ensure that everything you are doing um, does not attorney, uh, violate any rules of professional conduct. Um, they will ensure that your response is thorough and complete, and they will take the emotion out of it in order to give you the best answer that will uh, meet the AGC's requirements. Let's move to why are malpractice claims against attorneys on the rise right now, which if you didn't know, unfortunately, they are increasing. Uh, there's been several different reasons. You can see some on the screen here. Uh, less people are taking the bar exam. If you've noticed, um, there are a lot few ap fewer applicants than we've seen. And this is across the nation. This is not just in Maryland. So we're seeing that there's increased competition. We're also seeing that there are higher consumer expectations. What do I mean by that? Clients want more. They get a whiff of uh, night quarters back on uh, TV from what I've seen, right? So they know enough to be dangerous. They're watching Law and Order. They're watching all of these things, these judges shows that are out there. And they're saying, hold on, but I thought that this could happen and that could happen. And I want to be able to access you at 10 o'clock at night. And so we are bending over, right? We are doing the things that we normally wouldn't have done. We're giving cell phone numbers out now. How many of you all know that if you're going to use those communications like text message that is a part of the client's file that all of those communications need to now be put inside of the file i am not the biggest proponent for giving out uh cell phone communications or uh, contact information and if you do i certainly wouldn't necessarily recommend texting unless that is a routine unless printing off all of the text message messages have become very routine in nature. And what I mean by that is that almost needs to be done weekly, okay? Um, and then failure of the lawyer-client relationship. Simply withdrawing does not necessarily trigger that. A lot of times, maybe a withdrawal might be mutual. What I'm talking about is the lack of communication, uh, the missed expectations that you've set at, at the initial consultation that one of you two have not lived up to, whether that's the client not paying for their fee, whether that's the attorney not calling back or emailing back in a timely fashion. And then another thing is COVID. Unfortunately, though, the one thing that we're tired of talking about, right, that we thought we we, we finally got a hold over, uh, it's rearing its ugly head in different ways, not symptomatically, as we would know it, but in the malpractice world, in the professional discipline world. There is a study that is taken by the American Bar Association every three years. We're waiting because this is the third year um, or this is the, the last of the third year was in 2022. So we're waiting for the new report to come out. And that's the attorney discipline report. We believe and we anticipate that this attorney report is going to show that there are more claims as we've seen in the MLM world. We're also going to see that um, there has been a lower number of attorneys for different reasons in private practice. Uh, lots of attorneys decided to go corporate. They decided to close down their shop and maybe merge with a, a larger firm. 
Uh, and a lot of attorneys went to other resources like government, um, education. So we're not seeing a lot of the solo practitioner, small firms that we used to see in the past and just closing up a firm and not following the uh, instructions or the requirements by the state bar has caused a lot of the um, complaints that we have seen in the insurance industry. So claim frequency, what have we been seeing? I am so sorry if you practice in any of these top areas, but believe it or not, personal injury plaintiff work used to be at the top of this list. This list is very, very um, important to the insurance industry because this is how insurance companies rank areas of practice and how they rank their premium at times. So the higher risk areas of practice, the more you may pay in some insurance companies than others. The reason being is, let's look at criminal, for example. Criminal may be 5% of all the claims that we see. You don't see it a lot. Uh, sometimes there may be a habeas action. Sometimes they say, hey, I might not have received the case file. Lots of times, it doesn't go anywhere. Real estate. An attorney may um, uh, put the wrong date on a deed. Lots of times I see in the, um, the bottom section of a deed where they have to give the description, a lot number is wrong. And so when that lot number is wrong, now all of a sudden other things have occurred 10 years later where they say, oh, I'm trying to sell the property. My attorney way back when made this mistake. Now I need to file a bar complaint against them. And because it's happening so frequently, so frequently, the insurance industry looked at real estate and said, whether it's residential, whether it's commercial, we are not going to differentiate. And we're going to have to put some reassurance on that insurance that we give. We have to make sure. And a lot of times when we're seeing these real estate transactions, they're not just for a, a, a house price of maybe 250000 Those days are kind of obsolete now, right? In the market that we're in, lots of times we're seeing uh, maybe a, a 2,400 square foot home that might be selling for 550000 And so now we're saying, oh my gracious, could this be the amount of the whole malpractice suit? And believe it or not, that's what the complaints are alleging. That's what the addendum clauses are suing for, the entire amount. Do they get that a lot of times? No, but it's the fact that now we're having to defend a suit because that attorney made that one mistake on the lot description that could be worth a $550,000 uh, mistake, okay? So yes, real estate is at the top of the list. Personal injury, I could tell you tons of reasons why I was a personal injury attorney. When I look back at some of the things that I did, I said, oh my gosh, I am so glad um, that I know what I know now. But it's sad that I didn't know that in the past because they're just, um, for example, we have our paralegals, our receptionists. They might put the dates on our calendars. What if they put the dates on our calendars wrong? We are responsible. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more throughout this program. But we're responsible for their actions. Miss deadlines, miss statute of limitations. They are some of the highest uh, causes of actions against attorneys. Family law is up there on the list. And the reason being is not necessarily anything that may be substantiated. A lot of times the reason why family law is on the list is because of the emotional burdens it takes. In Virginia, where I practice, Virginia is a state that allows you to withdraw if it becomes so burdensome on the attorney, especially in a financial sense. So attorneys are permitted to withdraw so long as it doesn't burden um, the client and, and they can seek new counsel should they choose to do so. Well, in, in many cases, if they withdraw, we're seeing bar complaints, we're seeing malpractice suits, 
uh, simply because they say, even though the judge might have let them out the case, I still feel that I was materially burdened by this. Um, this action didn't allow my case to go well. They don't understand that you can't prove adultery by telephone laws. They don't understand that whatsoever. They feel that um, that was adultery. That should have been proved. The attorney withdrew because I owed $10,000 and that wasn't fair. Believe it or not, this is what we're seeing in the industry. And that is why we're at 12% because of clients like that. So just in case you're wondering, I talked about social, social practitioners early. I talked about uh, small firms. We consider small firms in the industry anywhere between two to four. And if you look at this chart, unfortunately, the solos do make up a large part, but then those small firms come right under it um, at 32%. Well, what's the rationale behind this? A lot of times what we're seeing is that because there may be a solo practitioner who necessarily can't afford staff, they can't afford the paralegals, they can't afford the receptionist, they're doing it themselves. They may not be able to afford a good conflict system. Um, they may not be able to afford a good calendaring system. And so when those things fall through the cracks, they're not able to check on their conflicts of interest, which is a huge, uh, huge, huge claim or cause of effect or cause of action, excuse me, against our, the reason behind why we have so many claims now. When we have things like that, that is why we have the solo practitioners, the small firms who have 34, 32% of the claims. Some of the larger firms, because they can withstand those expenses of hiring receptionists, paralegals, systems that will enable them to do calendar checks and conflict checks, because they have that, that's why they make up a smaller number. So now let's talk about claim frequency by activity type, okay? So what's the main activity that can lead to a claim? Human error, no doubt. I can say that all day, every day with my eyes closed, I know for certain that it's human error. Um, and the reason why is because of these numbers right here. So we've got preparation and filing. That is the hardest, uh, it's, it's a broad category. But the ABA has uh, really made it so that insurance companies kind of condense it all to the preparation of contracts, leases, deeds. So remember when I was saying before about real estate being so high, the preparation and filing and that wrong lot number, that would come under this category. General advice is what some clients will rely on, even in their initial consultation. So you might say, well, I was never hired by that client. So why are they filing something against me? Well, they are relying on the advice that you may have given them during that initial consultation. That's 20% of everything we see. Now, yes, you might have some advice that you give after they, after they have hired you, but a lot of this just comes from just the telephone conversation. Believe it or not, some of it even comes from responding to a blog or to a social media post. So for example, I have the law firm of Joy Von Malvin Griffin. Joy Von Malvin Griffin puts up a blog saying, I uh, feel so sorry and my deepest condolences go to the person who was killed on um, I-95 by the tractor trailer. As soon as I put that there, now someone wants to engage in dialogue with me. Oh, I didn't know you did tractor trailer cases. I have traumatic brain injury from a tractor trailer case. Uh, can you assist me with it? Yes, yeah, sure. Please schedule an appointment with my office. I'd be glad to help you. Instead of just saying, please schedule a, an appointment with my office, what mistake did I make? Yes, yeah, sure. They can hold on to that. And now when they come into my office and they have told me that this injury occurred 10 years ago, 
I've already said, yes, I can help them, but the statute of limitations ran out a long time ago. The best thing we can do is keep it simple and not engage in dialogue with the people until they have come into our office and we've learned a little bit more about the facts of their case. We also want to refrain from continuing the dialogue on social media where the public can see and now they've disclosed some information that could be a result of attorney-client privilege where they thought, hey, I'm thinking I'm just talking to you. Everyone else sees it. I've seen claims like that before as well. So some of the administrative errors that we've seen, and we're going to talk about three different categories here, administrative errors, substantive errors, and intentional wrongs. These, these are the categories that the industry, the ABA will use to try to say, uh, or try to categorize the different types of errors that come into the system, whether it be a bar complaint, whether it be a malpractice suit. So the administrative errors, do not think of this as just staff doing it. These are attorneys too. Uh, procrastination, that's huge. They say, hey, they just did not uh, meet that, that deadline. They, they waited too late. So that's a huge uh, percent within the administrative errors. Uh, I will talk about failure to calendar properly, um, where they didn't even put the calendar or, uh, for example, the scheduling orders. Think about how many times you might have Come back from court. You had your scheduling order. You give it to your paralegal and say, enter the dates in. Well, maybe the, the date for the expert designation wasn't on the calendar. I have a case like that. Thankfully, it's on the other side and they failed to do it. However, the opposing party has failed to make their expert designations, which is huge because remember, I told you, you got to have an expert to be able to say, why someone or why an attorney has committed malpractice. They didn't do it. So I'm really happy about this case and how it's going so far. Won't get into the rest of this. I'll leave it for your reading pleasure. However, um, I do want to talk about substantive errors. So this makes up out of the three categories, the highest and this is just failure to know and properly apply the law. This is where our expert really, really would have to come in to be able to say this attorney just did not do what they were supposed to do. I have a case where right now um, a person is alleging that an attorney um, was a civil attorney and not a criminal attorney as they uh, were referred by another attorney to be. This was a criminal case. They took a guilty plea, but they still said that the attorney was not well-versed in criminal law. I have no idea how the case is going to turn out, but in any event, this is how it was categorized as failure to know or properly apply the law. When we have allegations of something like this, this is why we would, or this is how we would categorize it in the insurance industry. Inadequate discovery and investigation a different case where they said that an investigator was not used for a family law case to prove adultery. Well, the investigation did not, or the private investigator did not turn up any information that would have helped prove the adultery claim. Getting still, opposing party felt that it should have been introduced in trial. And so now there is a complaint against an attorney for that. That makes up almost 8% of the substantive errors. Again, won't go into everything, um, but conflicts of interest is up there. It's only 4% um, of the substantive errors, but when you look at it as a whole, it's an alarming amount that we see. We're gonna talk about conflicts of interest a little bit more. Um, I will, before I get to the intentional wrongs, which is our last category, I do want to just talk a little bit about best practices for client intake. And so again, we are giving the clients a duty. We don't want to take the client's words and to put it into our own words at the onset. Have them fill these things out that we see on the left-hand side of the screen. They should be able to tell what's going on. Why is this needed? Because when we're trying to defend in a claim, what the client is saying is, 
Well, I never got a chance to tell the attorney everything that I needed. I never got a chance to make sure that um, or to let the attorney know uh, what the dispute was. They just they just went by whatever they thought it was. Well, now we've got this sheet of paper here, this intake sheet where you specifically said this is what you were looking for. That is what's helpful. That is what will protect you in a suit. Remember, you're talking directly with the client, not the client's mother. So yes, I used to do a little bit of criminal law uh, when I was in private practice. If they're incarcerated, you cannot rely on the family members only. You're going to have to make that jail visit. You're, you're going to have to pick up the phone and accept that call to talk to them. Um, the family member might not have been there. And even if they were there, they're not the ones incarcerated. You've got to talk directly to the client. But in the initial consultation, you don't want to put yourself too far in the deep end of the pool. Get the information that's necessary to do a conflicts check. If you start to get too much information, let's take a family law case, for example, an actual family law case where an attorney got everything. I mean, they captured documents. They started copying these documents. They found out all of this information that this wife brings in on this husband. All the while, they had never done a conflicts check to see that that husband, the same husband that she's divorcing, they also represent it in a debt collection activity. That's a huge conflict. You know more about his financial date. Now you're getting more information that could possibly be used against him in a different proceeding. Huge red flag right there. Okay. I also, also highly recommend if it hasn't been used in your practice, a, gift, a disengagement letter or a non-engagement letter, however you phrase it. In any event, this makes it crystal clear that if you are not going to be representing this client, they do not expect anything more because this letter has said you will not be proceeding. This has saved quite a few attorneys in the past, okay? And the opposite side of that, if you are going to be representing them, please make sure that you have them sign an engagement letter or retainer agreement, however you phrase it because this clearly sets the expectation. I just had an inquiry today where someone asked, hey, we're trying to figure out, can we withdraw from a case? Well, the comment section, I won't go in depth with it, but rule 1.16 um, talks about terminating and withdrawing as counsel. But if you read the comment section, in Virginia, we have a comment that says, yes, uh, you can do so uh, with or without cause if there is an agreement in place setting the expectations and showing that the failure of those expectations is burdensome on the attorney. Well, if the client isn't paying, but they had a retainer agreement that says it's $300 an hour, we expect that this is going to take 50 hours of time. And then you you know your retainer is going to be whatever. If that's clear, we have more standing in that case. I shouldn't say standing. We have a, a better footing in that case uh, and a better defense when we can show the retainer agreement and how it was not adhered to by the client. So as promised, the intentional wrongs. Intentional wrongs include fraud. It includes um, malicious persecution and, and libel and slander. We don't see many of these. Unfortunately, the types of fraud that I have seen in the past are mismanagement of trust account funds, intentional mismanagement. This is not the, oh my gosh, I accidentally wrote a check, but it hadn't cleared yet. It's not that. It's the I am going to take my fee out of this settlement or I'm just going to make the client settle. This has been going on for too long. They want 50,000, we're at 45. I'm just gonna accept it from the insurance company and move on. How to avoid malpractice claims in the different areas of practice. So this is where we can break it down a little bit. Now, I know MVLS has certain areas that they use so or that they practice in and that you all volunteer with. 
So if we get to anything that you're interested in, please don't feel like, oh my God, I can't do this. Just make sure you take some of those tips that we're offering you today to ensure that this um, volunteer service works out great for not only the client, but you as well. So business law. If you have a business law transaction, yes, yeah, some business deals can go bad and it's easy to blame the lawyer, but there are some tips that we have. What is it? Maintain the conflicts of interest. Do that first, just like we were talking about before. Because if you take this volunteer case and you do have a conflict of interest, you've messed yourself up, okay? Memorialize the scope of the representation. Now, this might be something that um, happens during intake, and I'm sure that Tim will, will talk a little bit more about that, but um, you shouldn't be representing multiple parties either. And I'm sure that that's something that's not going to happen, but even in your everyday practice, just like we would for criminal cases, separate the two. Take on one client, not both. There could definitely be times where those parties become adverse to one another, even though they might start off as best friends, okay? It's not wise for you as the attorney to represent multiple parties. Avoid entering into business contracts with clients. Uh, you might have a wonderful case, volunteer case that you get. The problem is what happens after your work is done? Okay, your volunteer work is done. Now you want to engage in maybe, uh, oh, I see this a lot of times, where in lieu of paying for attorney's fees, they will give you stock in a company. That might not be the best, best advice that I would give. Okay, now you're kind of muddying the waters. If you're going to be the attorney for a client, be the attorney for the client and keep it a business relationship. I say the same thing about serving on boards, not just clients' boards, but any boards. And the reason why I say that, I'm a board member for several nonprofit organizations. However, I tell them at the beginning of each fiscal year, I have it written down in the minutes. Just because I am an attorney, I am not the attorney for this board. Should you require legal representation, I encourage the board to vote to get a, an attorney to give proper advice. I am here as a board member only. Okay, so real estate. Real estate, again, is going up. It was second place for a number of years. It's going up to first place. So what can we do? Again, I can't preach this enough. Avoid your conflicts of interest. Supervise your non-attorney staff. That's where I was saying before how sometimes you get the lot descriptions that are messed up. Those cases, the lawyers will frequently say, oh, my paralegal did that. Well, under Rule 5.3, we still have a duty. OK, we're still responsible and we have a duty to look over our staff's work that they do for us. And then finally, avoid burnout. And I don't think that's just real estate. I think that's everywhere. OK, um, when you're overwhelmed, you're overwhelmed. You can't give more. Uh, my grandmother always says, and, and I'm sure everyone has heard it, you can't get blood out of a turnip. OK, so when you are already at the peak, you need to delegate. If you're the solo practitioner, it's not that easy, but don't take more, more than you can actually uh, bear. So the only other thing that I want to add to real estate, and this is kind of coming under the not the supervised and non lawyer staff, but even if it's just you, maybe you're solo and you're doing it by yourself, in any event, be very careful. If it takes you having to get another attorney to look it over just to make sure that you've dotted all your I's and crossed your T's is well worth it. You don't want to make those um, small mistakes that can end up in major claims years later. Family law. To all my family law practitioners, you have, you have my deepest, deepest sympathies at times. I know that can be a grueling process listening to the same phone calls over and over. He did not drop the child off at six o'clock. It is 6.03. Uh, you have those, those phone calls where they're saying, 
oh man, I don't understand. Uh, what was I supposed to do? Was I supposed to take them to the doctor? Was I supposed to take them to the emergency room? What does the order say? Can you give me a copy of the order? It can be exhausting. Hats off to you all, family law practitioners. What do I want to tell you about? If it's a divorce case, make sure you're doing full evaluations of marital assets, especially with the contested cases. Now, this is an uncontested divorce. How many times do we put in a separation agreement where we say the parties have divided all of their marital assets? Usually that happens in, a, in an uncontested case. When it's contested and they're fighting over the box of post-it notes, you need to make sure that there is some sort of identification and evaluation process over all the marital assets. There is a case that I literally, literally just received this week where there is a fight over the marital assets and the client thought that the attorney was going to list everything, including one of the ceiling fans that was listed. So watch out for second lawyer um, uh, syndrome. And what I mean by that is if you are the sixth attorney on this case and someone has come to you and said, oh, I just had to fire the other attorneys, they weren't listening to me, but I'm looking at your website and it just looks like we're going to click. You're going to click your way right to a bar complaint. That's what's going to happen because these types of clients are the clients that will go to the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth lawyer, and then now you're in this ever-evolving cycle. How many cases do I have now as a claims attorney where it is someone where they were the lawyer, the second, the third, the fourth lawyer on a case, and they just didn't take that as a red flag? Um it can be dangerous taking over the work of another attorney. So it's not just the client that you need to be concerned about, but it, it might be the work, right? And the reason being is, what if there was an attorney who completely botched the file? It's going to take too much for you to try to, to figure it out. What if you had that that case where I was talking about the divorce and they didn't use the investigation, the private eye um, report that there was no adultery being found. And so now you're the attorney that takes it over, but because they did not introduce that in discovery, it cannot be used in trial. So what has now happened? Now the client is also suing the second attorney saying, well, why didn't you use it? Even though you've explained to them, I couldn't use it because it was not introduced first in discovery and blah, blah, blah. They won't accept that. And now you're the subject of a malpractice suit. You've been brought in as a third party defendant. Communication is key. Communication is one of our rules of professional conduct. 1.4. I mean, it's, it's huge. So you have to make sure, especially in family law, they want you to be very responsive. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that when they call, you have to have a, a 10 minute rule. That's impossible. But Establish that at the onset, in the initial consultation. If you're going to take 48 hours to, to call someone back, let them know that. 48 hours is nothing unreasonable. That's very, very reasonable. But you want to make sure that you're articulating that to the client so they know what to expect. And finally, you might not agree with this. And I'm probably going to get a lot of the nasty looks, but don't sue for fees if you can help it. That is the number one cause of bar complaints. And it is a very, very high cause of malpractice suits. There will usually be a counterclaim in probably 90% of all the cases that we've seen where there's a suit for fees, there is a counterclaim that comes behind it that says the attorney did not do any of the work they said they were going to do. The bar complaint will allege the same thing. Oh, they sued me for fees, but they didn't earn the fees. So please, if you can avoid suing for fees, do so. I'm gonna try to ramp this up because I know that um, we only have about 20 minutes left. So with personal injury, don't dabble. Personal injury, speaking from a personal injury attorney, um, there are times where you just don't have a lot of time to do other types of areas of practice. When you have that personal injury, especially for the cases that go to a jury trial, for me, just being the OCD Virgo that I am, 
the week before, I couldn't really do anything. I had to set my um, self up just to prepare for that jury trial. I had to do my binder. I had to get all of my jury instructions. I mean, I just had to do so much. And so I didn't have time to fit in the, the traffic case here and there. I didn't have time to fit in uh, an uncontested divorce there. I had to set my eyes on that. So dabbling um, in, in any area of practice, unless you know, unless you um, feel very comfortable, unless you've attended CLEs, you've done this type of work for years, um, maybe even taught CLEs on it, being in personal injury, um, it's not the time to start trying to dabble in other areas of practice um, unless you are being trained, supervised, mentored along the way. Keep an eye on deadlines. I don't have to say that, but the number one cause of malpractice suits against personal injury attorneys is a missed statute of limitations. File early. I always had a six month diary in before the statute ended and four months was my flat deadline before statute of limitations to file a case, four months. That might've been stretching it, honestly, but I do know some attorneys will say, well, my flat deadline is two weeks. That gives me a little heartburn, okay? Um, be because another case that I have now, the insurance company gave the wrong name. They filed two weeks before and they didn't find out until later that the person the insurance company gave um, was the policy holder and not the driver. So now it's too late. Be careful with other jurisdictions and out of state defendants. Uh, you need to know their laws. You need to know how they can be served. You need to know what kind of jurisdiction you can have over them. So just be careful with that. And again, get mentors if you don't know about this, mentors who are very proficient in personal injury law. And then finally, talk to your clients about taxes and medical lien payments. You have healthcare providers, um, other medical facilities that will attach a lien. And if we know anything about liens in personal injury, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, they have a whole system uh, that is, is filled where you can just go to the computer and, and enter in a portal if you have the registration done. That is huge, 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 huge. And Medicare will come even four years after the fact to get their money uh, before you pay yourself. You need to know those liens should be paid. Debt collection. If you're going to be doing debt collection, there are a lot of different um, branches of the Fair Debt Collection Practice Act that you should be familiar with. If you're going to do this, again, make sure that you um, have some mentor. You're, you're just well versed in this act as, I, as number two states. Understand whether you're a debt collector or not. You might say, well, that's pretty dumb. I'm, I'm collecting on, on something for an attorney it's, it's, or for a client. It's not that easy. Um, if you are going to be a debt collector, there should be a disclaimer that is given um, in a voicemail. It should be a disclaimer given at, on a letter, a postcard, whatever you give out. It has to clearly identify with you being a debt collector for purposes of the requirement of the FDCPA. Never to threaten to take legal action um, unless you're going to do it. So we can't just um, say, oh, well, we're going to take you to court. Unless you're going to take them to court, we shouldn't say it. And then carefully identify the correct debt owed. How many times have I seen this? HOAs, they are notorious for giving the attorney one amount, then later saying, oh, we have to change that amount. Technically, they did pay in April. They just didn't pay in March. Be careful, okay? Make sure your client is double checking. Make sure that you are looking all at looking at all of the supporting documentation before filing suit. We are going to get to a state's trust and probates. Anticipate that there's always going to be a conflict of interest. <laughs> Find out how you can disprove a conflict of interest. This world is getting so small at times and you might have made a will for a grandmother and now the granddaughter is coming in to try to um, dispute her inheritance from her grandmother. You need to check to make sure grandmother was not that client uh, that you did the will for. Don't make assumptions. 
don't, uh, uh, it's, it's so easy to say, oh, you're going to leave everything to your husband, right? Maybe not, not necessarily. Uh, ask the hard questions. OK, those uncomfortable questions, because you need to make sure that they have mental capacity as well. Just because they're 90 years old doesn't necessarily mean they lack capacity. Right. It's important that we know at the execution of the will, at the execution of all documents. What did they have? I always had a script that I went by where I asked them questions to determine mental capacity. Document all decisions. Please write down everything. If you want to have the best defense for any sort of malpractice claim, you have to document everything, um, all, all the major things that happen in a case. If they tell you, hey, by phone, um, I do need you to change that provision. I don't want to leave my 2015 um, uh, Honda Accord to someone. I want to leave my um, 2020 Honda Accord to that person instead, okay? and understand privity laws. Who am I in contract with? Uh, who do I have that contractual relationship with? Okay, so what did we learn from the most recent ABA study on malpractice claims? So this is not the one that we're waiting to come from the end of 2020. This is the one from 2016 to 2019. And there are, um, According to the ABA, there are five malpractice claims by area of law. So remember, the one that I gave you before was MLM, and it had real estate at the top. Well, ABA from 2016 to 2019, they had personal injury on top. Family law was next. Real estate was next. A state trust and probates. And then you had collection and bankruptcy. And a lot of that is because of the Fair Debt Collection Practice Act. So studies over the last decade, I won't bore you with this chart, um, but you'll see how the numbers have kind of fluctuated between those personal injury, real estate, family law areas of practice. So claim types by activity, we went over this before, but a lot of it is failure to know or properly apply the law. So and we talked about also the administrative errors, substantive errors. The ABA does do one more category, and that's client relations. So client relations will talk about um, the communication with the client, how the client felt about the representation as a whole, and then intentional wrongs. Claims by firm size, we discussed this before as well, but unfortunately, the top areas are the solo practitioners and the small firms. And it's really just because of those solos and small firms who are bearing it all on their own and they don't have the staff to, to really help them. So this is just the comparison chart of what we've seen with regards to some of the claims coming in. A lot of these, as you can see, no payment, claim abandoned. Um, how how the these claims ended, where we didn't have to pay anything. We tell our clients, please report, report, report as soon as you find out, because we like to come in and do a claim repair if necessary. Sometimes we just monitor. So as you can see uh, with MLM, over half of all the claims that come in, we're able to close out. Nothing has happened. How many times has it gone to court and it's actually been dismissed? 18%, almost 20%, which is really, really good. Now, in the next two categories, these are the types of categories where we've had to pay out a settlement. Um, but as you can see, by getting in there and avoiding unnecessary defense costs that will extend throughout the trial, we were able to pay and settle the cases before a suit was even filed by around 16%. 8%, we were able to settle after that. And then only 6%, 6%. Is where we had a judgment for a plaintiff. Nationwide is only 1%, nationwide. So I think those numbers are, are pretty good. What does the 2019 study tell us about current trends? Well, unfortunately, um, it's, it's going up, um, especially for intentional wrongs. So that's something we can't really preach and teach about. 
that is where we do say make sure you're not clicking on the malware the ransomware not falling for the traps of the ponzi schemes that can be considered an intentional wrong as well settlement negotiation claims are also going up but they still make up a very um well, unfortunately, they're making up the fourth most common claim producing activity. So it's not saying that uh, ADR, that's not what we're talking about. They're still very low areas of practice. Settlement and negotiation is where uh, we are not paying the liens amount. We're not factoring in the liens amount to personal injury cases. This is where a uh, husband and wife come away from a settlement and say, I don't think I was treated fairly. I want to do this again, or I want to sue my attorney because they didn't really say, you know, talk about everything that I want in the mediation. Um, another increase, which is pretty huge, business transactions and immigrations has also increased. So I won't go into this too much, but we think that unfortunately it's going to increase likely because of COVID, um, the pandemic. Sometimes people are not able to get into the office. Sometimes people were missing statute of limitations, where we had those tolling periods where the courts would say, hey, you don't have to uh, file right now. We'll give a three-month extension. They were not adhering to the three-month extension. They forgot about it. So uh, that extension turned into, oh my gosh, I never got a chance to file it before then. And so what are our top 10 malpractice mistakes and ethics mistakes? missing the deadlines, just what I talked about. Conflicts of interest are, are up there suing the clients for fees. We've talked about engagement agreements and how we're gonna try to make sure that we're using those and non-engagement letters, but be especially specific with the engagement letters or the retainer agreements, okay? Dabbling. Uh, area of practice gets slow and maybe we don't need um, a criminal law. Criminal law was very, very slow paced. You can only, you know, take out the money from the trust account that you've earned, right? So if these cases were getting pushed out for years at a time because they weren't coming into court, now you're trying to pick up a, a, a different field. Maybe now you're trying to pick up family law. That is not a field that you can just pick up and start doing without a mentor, without going to CLEs, without sitting in court and listening to what's going on, without doing due diligence and figuring out the procedural aspects of, of family law. So dabbling can get us in a lot of trouble. Um, communication, business ventures being involved with uh, or, or boards like we talked about and clients' interests. Uh, fa failing to maintain your trust account. What's a way to get it at the top of the AGC's list is let a check bounce in that trust account. Misrepresentation, saying, oh yes, I can easily win this case and I can do that and I can do that and then not delivering on the promise. And then failing to properly screen clients, taking in that client where you are their 11th attorney. Dangers of dabbling, we've talked about this already, but think about it. That's just extra stress and anxiety on you. So if you can avoid that, and if you can spend a few months learning before actually going out there and trying to get yourself, maybe co-counseling, um, being co counsel with someone else, if you can do those things before just jumping right in, that will definitely take away the dangers that we see with dabbling. So what does this mean? You made a mistake, okay? Uh, what we've been able to, and this is not ours whatsoever, this came from the American Bar Association, but under the rules of professional responsibility, if you made a mistake, you now have a personal interest um, in how the matter is resolved and thus a conflict of interest. So if you made a mistake, what's the first thing you need to do? call your malpractice insurance company. The first thing people do when they make a mistake is they call their client and they say, oh my gosh, I made a mistake. Or they call whoever. Call your malpractice insurance company. Um, we are going to figure out the rules of 
professional conduct. Uh, we are going to make sure that you are abiding by that. We're making sure that we get defense counsel in who is very proficient in the rules of professional conduct with the AGC's office rules, with um, malpractice rules. They've tried these cases. They know how to do it. We're going to get you in contact with those people. Then we notify the client. Okay. Um, we'll talk about how you can inform the client of the mistake, and this is usually done in person. Um, disclose all facts, material. We'll tell you exactly how to do that. Defense counsel will lay out everything that you need to lay out. Avoid giving legal advice regarding the potential claim. A lot of times they will say, oh, well, you know what? I think you should consult with an attorney. And yeah, this may be malpractice. You're telling on yourself saying this may be a malpractice claim. Um, we will tell you exactly what to say. Don't, don't deviate from that. It might be a substantial mistake that you've made, but there's no mistake too big that your insurance company will not support you um, and, and give you the best advice they can under your policy provisions. Now, there are some some claims that are out there that you just say, hey, wait, why did you just steal this money? If it's an intentional wrong, keep in mind, some intentional wrongs like theft, like libel, like slander, and all those defamation cases, they're not going to be covered under any type of policy. So be very, very careful before you, you, you get involved in matters like that. However, I will say that if this is a missed deadline and you've adequately reported it, you promptly reported it to your insurance carrier and, and check with your insurance carrier on your rules and regulations about reporting. But as long as you've done that, your insurance company is going to support you and protect you according to your policy provisions. And I see a mistake on this slide because it says report the mistake to your malpractice carrier. I need that to go first. You need to make sure that you're doing that before anything else. And then lastly, just giving credit where credit is due um, to the resources that we use to give this presentation to you today. I just want to make sure that if you don't get anything else from this program, you know that the MVLS is a great program where you can volunteer, you can get your pro bono hours in, you can help your community and be a positive part of how we structure our legal system, where we are providing this service to our community. But at the same token, when you start to deviate from the advice that they give you in order to be able to take these cases, now you're setting yourself up for danger. And if you're in private practice, use some of these tips you know, that we've provided here today to ensure that your firm is abiding by the rules of professional conduct. And if by any chance you are faced with a disciplinary action, such as a um, AGC complaint or a profession, or excuse me, a malpractice suit, call your insurance carrier. If you don't have malpractice insurance, do not wait another day. Apply, apply, apply. Like I said, MLM is a malpractice insurance company servicing Maryland. Uh, we are in 33 years straight of providing dividends to our insureds. Uh, we are a mutual company where you are truly a part of our company. Prompt customer service. You have a wonderful, wonderful regional director in Kieran and Waters who sends her apologies that she could not be here today. She actually had another event. But at any time, if you need to reach Kiernan, you can definitely get in contact with her through Tim. And we thank you for the time today. If you have any questions even after this, please do not hesitate to contact any member of MLM. At this time, I'll turn the program over to Tim. All right, thank you so much, Joy. That was amazing. It was chock full of information. Um, with the last few minutes, I just wanna go through some bookend slides. Um, so Joy, since you're still controlling, can, can I just answer the next slide? All right, great. So for our volunteers, if you're looking for pro bono cases, you can just go to our pro bono portal, which is at the top right of our website, mvlslaw.org. We've circled it on the screen there. Um, next slide, please. Oh, wow. So um, just like today's training, we have um, several 
several, several trainings uh, for all areas of law that we are assisting with. If you're unable to make the training live, um, you can just check out the recorded version on our website, uh, which is at the top there. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just what the pro bono portal looks like. So if you're ready to take a case and you've gone to the pro bono portal, you can see that we have little case descriptors. You can um, filter it by county, by case type, and choose a case that you're interested in. Next slide, please. Um, if you're not yet an MBLS volunteer, you're interested in volunteering, please sign up today. And this is the link, but it's also at the very top of our website at mvlslaw.org. Um, next slide, please. And I just want to let folks know about some upcoming training and volunteer opportunities. Uh, so we have a My Home, My Deed, My Legacy Clinic coming up on February 28th. Uh, we have a tax sale foreclosure prevention training that same day. And then on March 10th, we have a human trafficking um, in the law, uh, combating misinformation, aiding and prevention, and helping survivors heal training. Um, to sign up for any of these, please just visit mvlslaw.org slash events. And I think that should be the final slide, Joey. But maybe not. All right, so it looks like that's it. Um, any questions? Uh, we have a few minutes. Uh, any questions, you can just put them in the chat, put them in the Q&A, we can answer them now. All right. Well, see you none at this moment. Um, this training has been recorded, so it's available. So if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to me and I can, um, Refer those to Joy and Kiernan, try to get those answered. Uh, lastly, I just want to thank you for your time again and everyone enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.